So, Epic, 128 PCI Express lanes with a four terabytes of memory support. Then you got Threadripper, 256 gigs of memory support. And then you got Threadripper Pro, AMD partnering with Lenovo. Well, what about something in the middle? This is an Epic motherboard to be sure, but I've only got eight DIMMs, so only one DIMM per channel, like Threadripper Pro. So this motherboard is gonna be limited to only one terabyte of memory. That's ridiculous. But can you still get it all 128 PCI Express lanes? Yes, yes you can. A combination of 5x16 PCI Express expansion slots, two NVMe slots, PCI Express by four, three U.2 PCI Express by four, and two Oculink PCI Express by eight interfaces. Now, like Epic, this motherboard has no chipset. Threadripper Pro has a chipset, as does Threadripper. That means more USB ports, more connectivity. Some of these PCIe lanes are connected to on motherboard peripherals. This motherboard has optional 10 gig Intel that can go right there. That'll use some of your PCI Express lanes. But this thing supports the whole, you know, if you want to run this, the, the 64 core epic monster CPU with this motherboard in an ATX case, you totally can. There's not really a lot to say about this motherboard other than it is solid as a rock. I tested this with the AMD Epic 7502P. Now, because this is a single socket motherboard, you can get the P variant of the Epic processors. It'll work with the Epic processors that don't have the P if you happen to have one of those laying around, but you should definitely get the P variant of the Epic processors when you're building a system like this because the P processors are a lot cheaper. Uh, Newegg right now, it's about $2,500 for the 32 core Epic ROM which is what I used to test this system with. 32 cores, max boost 3.35 gigahertz, one terabyte of memory support for $2,500? That's an incredible deal. I mean, I'm just thinking about workstation systems that I built you know, a couple of years ago. Technically though, workstation, oh, I use that word. Oh, there's gonna be some people watching this video and they're like, ah, not actually a workstation. Threadripper Pro is a workstation. Threadripper, maybe workstation, maybe desktop. Epic is not really technically qualified for Windows 10 Pro use. It's meant for server. Because of the nature of Windows and the Windows kernel, Windows Server 2019 and Windows 10, basically the same kernel. I mean, they are pretty much the same kernel. There's some stuff that happens at boot time where it's like, let's do this if we're pro, let's do that if, if, we're, if we're server. They make things a little different. Like for example, Windows 10 Home only supports a measly 128 gigabytes of memory. Come on, Windows 10 Home, get it together. This thing, will let you build a workstation based around Epic, which is not entirely something that AMD is comfortable with because of qualification. Qualification means that somebody is gonna go through and test workstation peripherals on this thing. Fortunately, you can lean on Tyann for that a little bit. So like in some of the, the Epic as workstation testing that I did a long time ago, uh, you know, basic things like, I'm gonna use a 2080 Ti with this, and it's like, nobody has tested a 2080 Ti with an Epic processor because that's not a thing that we'll do. And nobody has tested, you know, an Intel, an eight or 20 or 40 uh, drive NVMe array, even though you've got all those PCIe lanes, uh, at least using the Intel P4500 on Epic. There just wasn't time to qualify those kinds of things. Those are things that I've done personally, and things are better now than they were when, when Rome first launched. But this is still a pretty reasonable option if you're a data researcher or somebody that wants to run some kind of machine learning platform, and you're willing to get your hands dirty. This is a perfectly reasonable platform. But, you know, because the CPU does everything, I think we should stop calling these motherboards and just start calling them adapters, because this is really just you know, an interface adapter for the CPU. The, the CPU goes in and it's doing all of the work for the memory because the memory controller is integrated into the IO die. It's doing all of the IO for the PCI Express expansion slots. It's doing all of the interface for, I mean, it's just PCIe, like literally all of those pins, just PCI Express. You do have the A-speed IPMI, so you've got full IPMI VGA out, so you can get that on your IPMI interface and a few USB ports. And these are some one gig ports that are on this motherboard, but you know, optional 10 gig, like I mentioned. So there's really not a lot here. There is one micro SD interface at the corner of the motherboard. So if you need to run like VMware and you wanna run it off of a much more reliable micro SD card that is designed with high endurance in mind, you can put that there. And it's a lot easier to find a high endurance micro SD than it is a high endurance USB. So as 
you know, the system ages, if you're using something like VMware or, you know, TrueNAS that runs from a USB stick, it's gonna be a lot more reliable because you're using a lot more reliable flash as the base for the operating system for that configuration. Other nice to haves include front panel USB 3.0 interfaces, four pin fan headers throughout, uh, system management bus headers at the top edge here near the RAM. And then we've also got a couple of disk on module compatible SATA ports at the front here. Now with the disk on module compatibility, you may still need a special power feeder cable. I don't think these ports will feed power, at least with my eight gigabyte disk on chip module that I have that just clips in, it didn't power it. And I was sort of expecting that, but you do also have a header on the motherboard that you can sort of tap power from. So. Not sure about that. It does have a tiny Altera FPGA on it for managing some of the IO switching, lane switching, system management stuff. And it does have a JTAG header for the onboard FPGA. That's how you know it's a high-end motherboard when it comes with an FPGA, because those ain't cheap. This motherboard also has the best M.2 retention mechanism that I think all motherboards immediately everywhere should adopt. And that is, the, see these circles with like holes in the motherboard? It's a plastic retention clip. You just put the plastic retention clip in and then you push the M.2 down and it clips into place. And if you want to pull it out, you just squeeze and the M.2 comes out. There's no screw. Like everything, stuff that happens in servers happens first and then eventually it makes its way to the desktop. Truth be told, the first place that I saw that was in a Chinese server though, high gone. Now system testing motherboards like this is really important because if you notice the processor socket orientation is different. It's oriented this way because with servers, they'll usually have a sort of, not really a tower CPU, it's usually a copper cold plate with some heat pipes and the airflow direction is always front to back. There's no airflow at the sides generally in rack mount servers. So the fact that the CPU socket is rotated can foul up some assumptions that uh, tower cooler manufacturers make. Well, in a tower configuration, you can use a Noctua cooler on this. In fact, that would be my recommendation. Um, the Noctua 140 millimeter, 14, the fans can sit on top of the memory, so memory clearance is not an issue. Case clearance might be a little bit of an issue, but generally that's fine as well. Um, I use this in the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 900, as well as the Fractal Meshify S2. Both of those cases were good cases for this because of the ridiculous amount of airflow that those cases offer when you're you know, populating all of the fan positions. Because you are, after all, gonna run an Epic CPU. I mean, Epic, the, the, uh, you know, the processor that I was using, even though it's 32 cores, you know, it's not really that much TDP, even when we're running the, that 3.35 gigahertz turbo. The problem comes from adding lots of Tesla V100 cards, which produce a lot of heat. And technically V100 cards are meant for a server case, but I have a blower adapter, so not really a big deal. And also RTX 2080 Ti's, which again, blower style. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, blower style 2080 Ti's? No, no. Well, it turns out for machine learning, and if you're gonna put more than one 2080 Ti in a system and somebody's doing machine learning research, you actually do want the blower style cooler. One, because it takes air from the inside of the case and puts it on the outside of the case instead of dumping the heat back into the case, one. But two, when you've got a stack of multiple cards, it will actually run cooler if the cards are using blower style coolers because of that cooling configuration, so. The PCIe slot spacing here, of course, is, is pretty good if you're gonna run, say, three or four you know, dual height graphics cards. You do have one PCIe slot that's blocked, but with the PCIe lane rat routing here, it's pretty intelligent. So you can end up using some of your U.2 or the Oculink X8 for other peripherals. As always, check the tie-in website and the manual for this specific motherboard if you wanna know exactly how the PCIe lanes are routed. But with 128 PCIe lanes, you're pretty much gonna be able to use everything you see here without running into trouble because 128 PCIe lanes, it's, it's an unprecedented level of IO. Technically Threadripper Pro has more PCIe lanes when you count the uh, lanes that are coming off of the chipset because all those lanes get multiplexed into that X8 link to the, to the CPU. So that can be good for low medium speed peripherals. So that's been a quick look at the Tyan S8030. Thanks Tyan for sending this out so I could play with it. I was uh, tinkering, I was helping somebody with a project and uh, that went well. So uh, there wasn't anything that was weird that was happening. So I wasn't really needed, so it's fine. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. I'm signing out and I'll see you later.